And I am delighted to have the honor to introduce the first of the keynote speakers for RIDE 2022. Um, our speaker right coming up next is Ale Armelini from the University of Portsmouth, where he's Professor and Dean of Digital and Distributed Learning. And his role is to provide leadership in digital learning and learning innovation. And that includes both on campus and distance provision and across all faculties. Before joining Portsmouth, Ale was Dean of Learning and Teaching at the University of Northampton, where he was the strategic lead for the redesign of all programs for active and blended learning. And in his talk coming up next, Ale is going to be drawing on his work at the University of Northampton between 2012 and 2020 and at the University of Portsmouth since then. And in his talk, he's going to explore how institutions have approached a number of pedagogic strategies, including Portsmouth Digital Success Plan for Learning and Teaching, and some of the critical assessment challenges that have emerged, as well as how they've been addressed. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Ale. Ale, you're very welcome. Hello, colleagues. Thank you very much for inviting me to, um, to, to be the uh, opening keynote of your um, event at uh, RIDE 2022. Uh, and I've got some, uh, some ideas to share with you um, on, on, on the basis of uh, this plan, <clears throat> which I hope you can see on screen. I will <clears throat> begin with a few principles. I will briefly uh, relate to the active blended learning story, which largely took place at the University of Northampton between 2012 and 2020, <clears throat> and then move on to the uh, digital success plan for learning and teaching at Portsmouth. And I will conclude with a few ideas about the, the non-return to normal. Um, there will be uh, plenty of opportunity uh, for interaction, uh, particularly at the end. So I, I, um, I ask uh, if colleagues can help me uh, keep an eye on, on the chat so we can compile some of those comments, ideas and questions uh, and, and, and address them uh, towards the end of my presentation. So let me begin <clears throat> with some principles that I tend to use uh, when um, framing a discussion like this. Um, the first one uh, relates to content and context. Uh, and there is a tendency to believe by many of my colleagues that uh, uh, my students love my content, uh, when in fact what uh, they often mean is I love my own content. Uh, what matters is not really the content itself, but what students do with it how they do it, why they do it, and who they do it with. All of the latter provides the context. This is why uh, the first principle that I use here today is uh, context, not content, is king. Second <clears throat> is the tendency to believe that active learning only implies doing things. In addition to doing, Active learning implies thinking about what we do and doing it better next time. This is a very old concept, but it is always worth uh, reminding ourselves of what we mean by active learning. And as we will see later on, what we mean by active blended learning. The third point, the third principle is about integrity. And I will touch on this a little later as well. Uh, when we talk about uh, briefly about assessment in what I hope will be a bit of a segue to, to the following presentation. Um, integrity always, and if in doubt, go back to A. The next principle is about technology. Um, very often we hear things like technology as an equalizer. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make here is technology itself doesn't equalize. We do. And we have to ensure that we do and uh, not just rely on things to happen um, because technology is there. They won't. 
the fifth one and final one relates to uh, uh, the use of some of the language. I, I hear a lot um, uh, this, 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 this phrase, deliver learning. Well, however, try, however hard we try, uh, we cannot do that. There are many things that can be uh, done in, on, and about learning, but deliver is not one of them. And let me explain that a little bit more. Um, you might you might be familiar with uh, the original version of this one. Uh, those who can teach, those who can't, just deliver content. And uh, in in relation to that delivery element of my final principle, I ask you colleagues if if we want teaching to be a bit like this, hopefully not, or indeed a bit like that. Again, hopefully not. So we cannot really deliver learning. We have to do other things. In other words, teach well. We also get a little bit um, um, sort of, uh, obsessed with expressions like technology enhanced learning. And I ask uh, whether we should. Um, do we talk, do we really talk about uh, things like book enhanced learning or pencil enabled learning or expressions of the sort? Um, well, really, if we are going towards, if we're heading towards true normalization, where tools and technologies become really transparent, invisible, then we should not be highlighting the technology enhanced bit, people enhance with technology, not technology itself. I mentioned before that uh, active learning implies doing and thinking. Uh, this is the original quote. It is uh, from 1991 and it's still helpful for us uh, today. Let me move on to the brief <laughs> version of the active blended learning story. Um, and I'm cutting a rather long story short here, but in one slide, uh, this, is, this is what ABL, um, this, is, this is the sort of original ABL uh, representation where we do or we did have at that point uh, uh, a combination of the first two boxes there, particularly the sense-making activities element of this. We tend to think that, that this, this exposure to content on the left magically translates in student engagement with that content prior, for example, to attending a face-to-face -face session. Well, that doesn't always work like that, and it doesn't work very well. Uh, we need to to think hard about integrating that content with what learners do with that content. Hence, context is king. That scaffold, <clears throat> which extends uh, into the classroom, beyond the classroom, can happen individually or in groups. Mm -hmm. that, that is, that is what, what uh, we encourage colleagues to, to, to spend time on, creating a, a meaningful scaffold through highlighting what learners do with the content and what they think about what they do with that content. Now, this, <coughs> this diagram is a little bit linear, rigid and blocky. <clears throat> so this is a slightly different version of the diagram where center stage is sense-making activities. Uh, the activities have the embedded content and resources. <clears throat> the scaffold is still represented there. Um, there are real-time sessions mm, that serve multiple purposes of analysis, discussion, uh, goal setting, critique, and the, there is post-session uh, consolidation, evaluation, and reflection. And you will notice that on both of these slides, <clears throat> words like online uh, do not feature. These things can happen online, but they can also happen in other modes of study. What really matters is 
is whether the design of the course involves synchronicity, asynchronicity, and various creative combinations of both, depending on the pedagogical context where we are working. Which takes me to a very late 1990s, early 2000s definition of blended learning. And uh, uh, give or take a few adjectives, thoughtful, meaningful, combination of face-to-face -face and online, really, is that really what we mean? I would put it to you that we should really steer clear of these types of definitions and move on to rather more context sensitive, multi-layered, more exciting definitions of the blend. <clears throat> and there are multiple other dimensions of the blend in addition to whether something happens in a physical environment, in a lab, in a classroom, or if it happens online. There are many other things to consider. These are some of them. <clears throat> uh, yes, face-to-face -face and online might be an element, but that's just one of many. A critical one, a critical one is time, synchronicity, whether something happens in real time or not, uh, and what blends we can find between the two. We had, at my previous university, the University of Northampton, we had an, an official, a published definition of active blended learning, which is there. Uh, this definition helped us uh, a lot in terms of uh, making sure that everyone was um, together in the sense of understanding what the university had as an official statement for ABL. Um, in many ways, following months of discussion, consultation, review, and so on, in many ways, this definition helped us keep people together, keep people, well, this is, this is what we mean, and we reduced the amount of um, uncertainty uh, about what blended learning or indeed active blended learning meant in the university. We have something similar at the University of Portsmouth, <coughs> which is referred to as blended and connected learning. And again, we have a definition, an official definition, uh, which again uh, focuses on what learners do, <clears throat> what learners do and how they can demonstrate that they, that they have reflected on what they do. And this is, this is uh, an attempt uh, by the university to capture that sense of blended, blended and connected learning. There are, many, there are many options, there are many references to this. <clears throat> Here are some of them. But um, I would like to, to move on to uh, this slide, which gives you a, a bit of an opportunity to rehearse your Spanish on the right-hand side. Spanish is my mother tongue. <clears throat> uh, the, the cartoon, as you can probably guess, says that in 1970, the teacher is saying, I will dictate my notes in 1990. I will give you photocopies of my notes in 2010. <clears throat> I will give you uh, my notes through a PowerPoint presentation. And in 2019, I will uh, share my notes on a drive, uh, on a virtual drive. <clears throat> and uh, the points here, uh, as, as, as you have obviously uh, identified already, is sometimes we, we can change tech, we can change uh, tools, uh, but sometimes the approach to learning and teaching doesn't change. And that is rather problematic. Uh, many higher education tutors and lecturers learn about teaching as they teach. Uh, some of them confuse a teaching qualification with fellowship, which is professional recognition. Uh, many colleagues learn about online practices as they were implementing them. They have very little choice. Sometimes there is very little support in the universities to do otherwise. And emergency remote teaching, ERT, was actually a sudden opportunity to learn about pedagogy. <clears throat> so let me, let me show you three types of uh, change in uh, in. in in, in universities when it comes to learning and teaching practice. Uh, responsive reactive, 
radical, innovative, developmental, incremental. Um, responsive, reactive, something happens, you react to it. A radical, innovative, you're bringing left field, unusual, unexpected ideas onto the table. Developmental, incremental refers to more of a slow burn change um, that it happens within the culture. Uh, so the, the, the wholesale redesign of the entire portfolio of courses at Northampton to active blended learning was very much an example of developmental incremental change. It took us the, the best part of six years to do that. Now they interact with each other in different ways, but the key thing is, is, is turning changes that occur on the periphery into the mainstream. That's, that's what's really important here. How, how can we use evidence from what happens uh, in any of these areas of change? How can we use that to generate other positive change in other areas uh, with appropriate adaptation? So if we place some of the things I've mentioned uh, so far uh, onto this diagram, active blended learning <clears throat> went through a process, a journey, if you like, uh, which overlaps developmental, incremental, radical, innovative uh, into the center, into the mainstream to become uh, the university's, what they call a signature approach to learning and teaching. Um, emergency remote teaching, uh, came through a different route, and by definition, it it, it was emergency. So so it, it it didn't become mainstream as such, although many elements of ERT did. Uh, but it came through a different route, uh, and finally, blended and connected learning is on its journey at the moment. It it, it started off prior to the pandemic uh, as a developmental incremental process, and we hope. Uh, it couldn't become mainstream practice across disciplines at Portsmouth. Moving on to what we are doing at Portsmouth in, in, in terms of blended and connected and other areas that I'll show in a moment, I'll focus for uh, a few minutes on the uh, Digital Success Plan for Learning and Teaching, which uh, has that particular aim and is built uh, on, on the 6P framework. Uh, fortunately, Portsmouth also begins with a P, uh, so we can have actually seven rather than six. <clears throat> so we've got pedagogy, we've got principles, we've got place, partnerships, uh, portfolio and prospect, and those together interact in various ways to generate what we refer to as the Portsmouth experience. For the purposes of today, uh, I would summarize the five aims of Portsmouth, uh, of the Portsmouth Dis Digital Success Plan uh, as shown on that slide. And, um, and in particular, uh, for today's purposes, it would be good perhaps to, to focus on aim one, uh, which is uh, fully realize the concept of blended and connected learning as part of Portsmouth pedagogic identity. In order to do that, uh, we are deploying uh, a slightly uh, different uh, version of the uh, redesigned process we used uh, at my previous university and elsewhere across the sector, uh, which we refer to as uh, the enable process, which helpfully has active blended learning in the middle of it. Now, enable is indeed a, a redesigned process that builds on from uh, other well-researched methods, uh, such as the Carpe Diem approach uh, that Julie Salmon and I worked on for years at Leicester and elsewhere, that I subsequently evolved into the Cairo approach at Northampton and now enable here, plus the, the ABC approach at UCL, plus uh, intensive, intensives at Brooks and many other variations of, of all of the above across the sector, not just in the UK, but internationally. Enable consists essentially of three phases, the design needs analysis, the workshop itself, and the review meeting. And I can talk to you uh, extensively about uh, each of those, 
there are multiple resources available uh, for, uh, for Enable. The website is there at the bottom, enable.portbc.uk, where you can have a look at, at the sorts of things that we use uh, to work with multidisciplinary teams um, that want to either design a new course or a new module or refresh an existing course or module. Enable operates at both levels. Enable, enable, enable works with employers, with students, with staff, uh, with learning technologists, and they are usually, the workshops are usually facilitated by learning designers. Um, this is an example of, of, of an activity that we tend to, we tend to use uh, and not, not, not to prescribe practice, but to illustrate the types of issues that we encounter uh, when uh, we have perhaps a, uh, an excessive focus on delivery rather than teach. It is important also to address in this, in this environment words, practices and technologies that have emerged more prominently. They are not new, but they've emerged more prominently uh, in the last two and a half years. And one of them is this notion of hybrid or high flex, uh, by which uh, I mean uh, the simultaneous teaching of uh, on-site and remote students. Um, there are some issues uh, in, in, in relation to high flex, as, uh, uh, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, the position of my university in relation to this is, is do it only if you must, but we do not recommend the use of hybrid or high flex for a number of reasons. Um, ultimately, both the teaching and the learning experiences suffer quite significantly as a result of this. And it is a technology that, um, uh, that is conducive to certain teacher-centered practices that are not consistent with blended and connected. In one word, I would summarize it as reach is one thing, teach is another. And we must not confuse the two. If we want to enable further access, uh, to higher education, then we have to, we, we, we must not uh, do that at the cost of teaching badly. We've got to teach well, both cohorts, both groups of students, campus-based and non-campus-based. You might uh, also be familiar with this um, Gartner hype cycle. This is the 2021 version. You might uh, realize you might uh, find that uh, here uh, at the top, that's where high flex classrooms are. Uh, certainly um, in 2021, high flex classrooms were at the top of the peak of inflated expectations. Uh, and, uh, and that seems to be uh, consistent with, with our experience of it. Uh, as a senior colleague uh, of mine told me, um, uh, she said from another institution, she said, well, we, we, we do high flex only by necessity, not by choice. Moving on to the final uh, components or final bits of my presentation, colleagues. Um, this is my next slide is a very good example of what we should not do on a slide, but I'm going to do it anyway to illustrate a point. Um, this is a piece of writing that I don't expect you to read. Now, that piece of writing was generated by a robot. That piece of writing uh, was generated uh, in a matter of about 10 seconds after I inserted words as shown here. I went to uh, one of the uh, free um, uh, artificial intelligence engines, in this case, u.com slash write. I entered those keywords. I chose, I chose a style, which could be uh, persuasive, uh, informal, friendly, all, all that sort of thing. I inserted those keywords and hit enter. And in a matter of seconds, I had that piece of writing, yeah? Um, which um, raises a number of very, very interesting 
questions about uh, subsequent developments in artificial intelligence and how they can or should, or maybe perhaps should not, uh, be used in an academic environment. An open discussion that particularly relates to assessment that I'm sure uh, subsequent speakers will touch upon. There are many other much more complex engines than, than this one I'm showing you, and I would I would particularly uh, uh, point you in the direction of uh, GPT-3, uh, which is one that, that, that maybe is worth uh, looking at. Finally, <clears throat> the non-return to normal. And uh, if we map synchronicity and proximity in a rather crude way like that, uh, what we have seen from staff, from students, and from others following uh, the, the easing of restrictions, we have seen uh, a tendency to um, request and operate within lower proximity and lower synchronicity. So there is a preference uh, for perhaps not being in the office five days a week, nine to five, uh, there's a preference for uh, a way of working that, in brief, means lower proximity, lower physical proximity, and it also means uh, being in real time uh, a little bit less than we used to prior to the pandemic. So in many ways, we are shifting mm, towards the, uh, the low, low element of this quadrant. Uh, and uh, again, this very much <laughs> depends on, on, on context, but this is something that we are, we are observing across a sector and across other sectors for that matter. Uh, when it comes to learning and teaching, uh, we've got to consider that too, and we've got to design accordingly. The enable process that I described briefly earlier uh, does address this particular aspect of, of pedagogic design, which um, uh, which I often summarise as, well, do we, do we want to return to normal? Well, no, not really. We've got to design well. We've got to teach better. Mm? We've got to mainstream lessons learned uh, during and before COVID. Some of these lessons are actually quite old. Um, we need to turn those lessons into added value for students and colleagues. We cannot really afford to go back. Colleagues, with that, I will conclude the, the presentational element of, of this, and um, I will hand uh, back to Stephen and colleagues uh, to perhaps moderate uh, a Q&A session, if that's okay. Uh, so I shall stop sharing at this point and move back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alain, for a really stimulating and excellent start to our conference. Um, Lots of really exciting ideas in there. Um, I'm just, I've been looking at the chat as, as we were going through, and there are some comments in here. What you've been describing, Ali, is, is really exciting. And, and, I, and I'm sure that, uh, like me, many people were, were nodding as we went through. But the, a big challenge is always getting these, what to us seem very sensible, rational, approaches adopted within the institution. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, I think the word adopted is, <laughs> is, um, is interesting because uh, uh, very often there is broadly, not, not universal, but broadly there is agreement on, um, on many of these principles and many of these practices associated with the principles, but it, um, it, it becomes extraordinarily difficult to shift practice from where colleagues are to where they themselves would like them to be or would like to be as, as, as practitioners. Uh, so um, generally the, 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 the the process that we've observed is very much around adapt and then adopt. Uh, and then and that, 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 that is reflected differently across disciplines, across 
uh, course teams, across uh, individual colleagues, um, they, they do tend to take on board uh, these ideas, provided that there are three key elements in place. One is evidence, as you might imagine. The second is support. And the third is agency. Uh, evidence in, uh, for, for, for pedagogic change or indeed any other type of change in an academic environment, uh, you, you will not bring people with you unless you have uh, a significant body of evidence to, to support it. The second element, uh, support, uh, relates to, to what, what systems, processes, people, resources uh, are, are in place uh, to enable those uh, who who are trying to change and who are trying to, to shift their practices um, to support them in that process sometimes can be a little uh, difficult and time consuming. The, um, uh, the, the Carpe Diem, Cairo and Enable processes are uh, examples of this. Support mechanisms in place. And the third one is also critical, it's agency. Whatever we do uh, with colleagues, with other stakeholders, must be based on the notion that agency continues with the colleagues, that uh, they are best placed to establish what is best for their students in their particular contexts. So the three elements of evidence support and agency, they need to be firmly in place uh, for changes of this kind and at this scale um, to, 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 to operate, to be embedded and to succeed. Um, so that's my sort of short answer to, to, to adapting and adopting. Thank you very much, Ali. There's, there is just one small um, follow-up to that because uh, we have got a question in the Q&A, which is similar, but it's, it's focusing specifically on convincing reluctant bra brackets, older close brackets colleagues. Do you think age makes any difference to, to the advice you've just offered? Not in my experience. I have seen all sorts of uh, reactions to this sort of change uh, across age groups. Um, I, I, I cannot, mm. I cannot, uh, I wouldn't be able to generalize that at all. Um, I've seen the most incredible practices, innovative risk-taking practices from people of all ages. And I've seen the most uh, resistance from people of all ages too. I, I remember um uh, colleagues uh two colleagues from a discipline that i will ask you to guess which one that is in a moment um they they we were having a coffee uh, and um uh, th this was a a, a, a well-seasoned mature uh professor with a very young um uh, new junior lecturer uh having a coffee with me and um uh, so the older the older person looks at me and, and, and says that the thing is that you, you, you don't understand in my discipline, students can only learn. And he paused through a lecture and he spoke and that in that way. And the, 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 young, the young lecturer uh, agreed and, uh, and said, well, actually this is, this is how in, in, in our discipline it works. So that's one example. There are opposite examples where, um, where, where people not only embrace this sort of risk-taking approaches, but they, they experiment in the most fantastic ways uh, with, with, uh, with approaches, not just with tech, but with approaches that otherwise would, would be unthinkable. Uh, the, um, the, the discipline in question was law, by the way. Um, so... Uh, the short answer, again, to your question is no, I, I cannot see um, uh, any generalizable uh, pattern uh, in terms of age. OK, thank you. Ali, we've got a different kind of question now. Um, I, again, it's, it's one I recognize that uh, I've heard a lot of people articulate, um, certainly recently and perhaps over a longer period. And that is, do you think actually we should stop talking about educational technology? Um, given the, what you said earlier about technology facilitated learning, and maybe we should just talk about education. Yes. <laughs> Good. Here's a quick answer. 
<laughs> yes, uh, uh, and, and that, that same principle applies in, 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 well, it applies to technology enhanced learning as I, as I uh, try to explain in my presentation, uh, but it applies in, in other ways too, uh, for the same reason that we don't talk about <clears throat> whiteboard enabled learning and, mm. and, and pencil mm -hmm. enabled learning. Book enabled. Mm. Yeah, yeah it, it, it just doesn't make much sense. We are, we are <clears throat> uh, normalizing practices and we to the point that they are invisible, the, that these elements, these technologies, these tools in the classroom become largely invisible uh, and, 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 and their use becomes standard in, in, in people's practices. OK, thank you. We've got a couple more questions I can see. Um, uh, I, I'm relying on you, Linda, to keep an eye on the time. Is that OK? Yes, I'm, 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 I'm keeping an eye on that. Good, good. So thank you. Um, one from Jonathan San Diego saying, picking up your point about high, fl high flex hybrid in relation to teach and reach um, as being a useful insight. Learning design plays a significant role for this mode to be effective. That, that, that's a question. Learning design plays a significant role for this mode to be effective. And any thoughts on cost efficiency, therefore? <clears throat> many, many thoughts. And yes, learning design does... Uh, uh, does play a role and can help significantly. <clears throat> and what um, there, there, there are certain things that uh, <clears throat> that the literature has started to pick up, <clears throat> and we have um, we have the usual enthusiasts uh, reporting uh, wonderful experiences of high flex, uh, uh, but equally we've got. Uh, uh, a growing number of colleagues uh, saying, "Well, um, let me let me illustrate the point." Uh, um, a group in the School of Education at uh, Russell Group University um, uh, only a few weeks ago <clears throat> uh, were telling me uh, their own story about about this as a team. Uh, they volunteered. I repeat, School of Education. Uh, they volunteered to to pilot uh, Highflex uh, and to um, and to uh, research this in a way that would inform practices by others. Uh, unanimously, all colleagues in that group that were talking to me uh, said, well, we regret having put ourselves forward for this. Uh, and this, this has multiple, multiple hooks, if you like. One is, is, uh, is of, of a pedagogic nature. Um, very often these things are done so that others who are not in the room can, quote, listen to it later. That already tells you the sort of teaching practice that is expected, because if you start doing things that cannot be listened to or that become rather messy or noisy, uh, then subsequent viewers have trouble uh, accessing this in a meaningful way. So that's a quick example of a pedagogic reason uh, why they were regretting their decision. Um, there, are, there, there are technical reasons as well. Things go wrong uh, and fail. Uh, tech support is necessary and costly. Um, there's a significant element of training, regardless of what vendors will have us believe. You go in, you press a button and off you go. It's never quite as easy as that. Uh, there are things that go wrong all the time. And there's the overall cost element of this. Uh, when I say reach is one thing, teach is another, I really mean that. Uh, I really mean that uh, it's all very good to, to reach more learners. And, um, but, but wouldn't it be even better to teach them well? And, 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 and this, this notion, this fantasy that, that oh, remote learners... Uh, base anywhere in the world would love to build a community with campus-based students. Well, actually, uh, I think that is not the case, uh, that we need to address the needs of those studying on campus in the way that they deserve and the needs of those studying remotely in the way that they, that they deserve and teaching well both constituencies is a key part of this. Following on from that, then, Lin Linda's asked a question, which I, I, I think does, does follow directly, uh, which is, does success in high flex or hybrid therefore indicate success in teaching? 
that is to say in the sense that a teacher with a sound understanding of facilitation of learning will be able to make hybrid work. What, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, the best teachers will make things work even against the odds. Uh, uh, a very poor pedagogic design in the hands of an excellent teacher will probably result in an excellent experience anyway. And that, uh, and, and hybrid is no, no exception to that. Uh, but when, when a university tells you, uh, yeah, do it, do it this way because they intend to upload the recording somewhere, uh, then you're talking about a slightly different element that was not considered as part of the uniqueness of the real-time synchronous experience. And that's where the confusion comes mm. from. Uh, the moment you want to apply a, a dual purpose in, in, in this practice, so that, by the way, you also satisfy the needs of others um, who are not there, either in the classroom or, or online in real time, then you, then you run into problems. Uh, look, I, I started, I, I taught my first HyFlex session in 1999. Uh, we were using... Uh, old dedicated data lines. This is this is before many of the technologies we have today existed. I was using a multi-point bridge, uh, and and I had people in the room and people in four remote locations across the country. Uh, I can tell you, it was a nightmare. Uh, it was a nightmare then, and I would suggest it's still a nightmare today, despite the fact that <laughs> that uh, twenty three years. Uh, has passed and technologies have evolved. Yes, things are easier today, uh, but the actual teaching practice of satisfying the needs of those in the room, as well as those remotely in a way that is not teacher-centered, in a way that is not, uh, that is not uh, suitable for someone else to watch the recording or listen to the recording, like, that is a huge task. I found it extraordinarily stressful, as indeed the literature suggests now, 23 years later. Perhaps we should turn our backs on the nightmares for, for a moment and um, pick up a question that David Bohm has asked, which is, Ale, do you have any success stories to tell us about shifting attention away from teaching, by which I presume um, David means telling people things, and, and towards supporting or provoking learning? Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question well, but do I have success stories about this? Yes, uh, I have um, uh, many success stories in, in, in both of uh, universities where I've, uh, um, <laughs> where I've been operating in the last 10 years. Um, uh, to, to, to see colleagues uh, reflect on what they were doing and reflect on what they are doing now and thinking, well, uh, I, have, I have achieved a much more satisfactory blend of my own practices. Nothing to do with onlineness or face-to-faceness here. It's about my own practices. Achieving that um, level of satisfaction with the fact that, well, I, I, I remember my own, my own practices one, two, three, five years ago, and I look at myself now uh, in, in, in the light of all of this. And I said, why, why was I ever doing that? Um, for me, that, that shift is a success story. And if you scale up that shift, then you have uh, a significant pedagogic change in an institution. Course teams, course teams are key agents of change in that respect. And, um, uh, and even if it, it may sound rather trivial, to, to, just to move the needle a tiny bit towards learner centeredness, moving the needle a tiny bit towards doing and thinking rather than just delivering. Uh, even that minor change is a massive change. <laughs>